Good evening and welcome to the Ann Arbor District Library on AADL TV. Thanks for tuning in for tonight's presentation of Exploring the Mind with the University of Michigan Department of Psychology. In just a moment, Christopher Monk will introduce our guest, Dr. Omar Ahmed. To find past Exploring the Mind programs or view other virtual events, visit aadl.tv. Okay, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Omar Ahmed. Omar is an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. He completed his undergraduate degree in neuroscience at Brown, and he went on to get his PhD also at Brown, and then he became a research fellow at Harvard Medical School. Omar's research focuses on how space, time, and speed are encoded in specific regions of the brain. He also focuses on how these same neural regions go awry in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy, with the goal here of identifying how novel, uh, identifying novel targets for therapies. Omar has published in many high-impact journals, including Nature Neuroscience, Brain, Journal of Neuroscience, and Cell Reports. His work has been recognized by an award from the American Epilepsy Society and through grants from the National Institutes of Health, the Whitehall Foundation, and Michigan, the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Omar's talk today is entitled, How the Brain Helps Us Navigate and Why People with Alzheimer's Disease Can Struggle to Find Their Way Home. Here is Dr. Omar Ahmed. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, and I will, as Chris said today, talk to you about the importance of navigation and how these navigational abilities can be impaired uh, in people with Alzheimer's disease and our focus on a particular brain region that we think is really important to understand so that we can try to see what goes wrong uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So the importance of navigation has been appreciated uh, for centuries. Um, it's critical for the survival of most species, and all animals need to travel repeatedly from their home to their food source and back again, and it's critical that they're able to do this seamlessly without uh, going into harm's way, for example, where a predator may live. And indeed, because of evolution, most species are remarkably good at finding their way home, even in the absence of any external guiding cues that may have helped them. And Charles Darwin recognized this uh, in an 1873 paper, and he called this ability to seamlessly find your way home. He referred to it as dead reckoning, and also thought about how it may actually come about, what specific um, senses may animals be using to actually seamlessly navigate their way home. So he said, this is chiefly, no doubt, uh, accomplished using eyesight, but partly perhaps by the sense of muscular movement, which is him saying that maybe animals are keeping track of how they're moving their muscles and that's how they're finding their way home seamlessly. And he compares this in the same manner as a person with his eyes blinded can proceed for a short distance in a nearly straight line or even turn right angles and back again. So he's basically saying, look, even without eyesight, you can navigate. You can count your steps perhaps, and you can find out ways of heading in the right direction. And we really want to understand these mechanisms. And today I'll give you a little bit of an overview of some uh, strategies employed by various species to navigate their environments. And we'll focus in on mammals and really understand some of the neurons that can help encode navigational information. So let's first start with three really uh, almost bizarre and very diverse navigational strategies that you'll find in nature. Here's the first one. Desert ants are notoriously good at navigating these vast deserts without any cues that are different. So it's just all bright sunlight the entire time, all desert, yet they'll be able to take left and right turns, navigate for long distances to find some food and then essentially make a beeline to return home, straight to their home. They're really, really good at this. So the question is, how do they do it? Well, a study in 2006 referred to over here on this slide um, did a very, uh, um, very neat trick 
they let the ants navigate their way to the food source. But then before they returned home, they put little stilts that you can kind of see here onto their legs, essentially doubling the length of their legs. You can see the little stilts there, um, those little red sticks right there. So now their legs are twice as long and they're at their food source and now they want to return home. Remarkably, the ants that had these tilts on, whose legs had been doubled in length, they actually walked back to their home, but kept going. They walked twice the distance. And the authors did a lot of other controls and concluded desert ants are essentially counting their steps. They literally count their steps back home. I've taken 500 steps in this direction. I've taken 400 steps in this other direction. I now need to take, let's say, 900 steps in this average direction to get back home. That literally seems to be how they, how they navigate. So really remarkable uh, capability of ant brains to keep track of all of these steps, a very large number of them. Here's another remarkable example of uh, navigation uh, in nature. Uh, we're all aware of migrating birds, such as the European robin, which loves to migrate uh, at, at nighttime. Um, and it's long been hypothesized that birds are able to migrate such long distances with such great accuracy by sensing the Earth's magnetic fields. But a correlate, a biological correlate of this has kind of, has been relatively elusive. A paper just this year, actually, in Nature uh, showed that there exists a magnetically sensitive protein called a cryptochrome that is actually located in the retina, the eyes of these birds. And this cryptochrome has, has these two states that it can exist in. And the relative balance of these two states, shown here when the bird is, let's say, facing south, you can see it's more in this lighter pink state rather than the dark red state. And now shown here, when it changes direction, you just get more of the dark red. So these magnetic sensing cryptochromes can actually allow birds to track their direction relative to the Earth's magnetic field. And you can imagine why that would be so powerful a method to navigate the way they do and to migrate the way they do. So here's, here's one, one more really remarkable example. Um, you're all probably familiar with uh, anyone who's got a garden occasionally on the mulch, you'll probably see some slime molds growing there. But these slime molds are not fungi. They're, they're not really any other uh, similar kind of species either. They're called protists. And they're single cell organisms. So just a single cell, although they can have multiple nuclei. And you'll see them sometimes just spanning uh, in the garden in search for food. And these remarkable slime molds have a very unique capability in terms of navigation. And I'll play this short video here uh, from PBS Nova. Meet the slime mold Physarum polycephalum. It looks kind of like a fungus, but it's actually a single-celled life form known as a protist. The thing about Physarum is that it doesn't have a brain or even a nervous system, but nevertheless, it can make surprisingly sophisticated decisions. For example, slime molds can find the shortest route through a maze toward a piece of food. First, the slime mold extends its tendrils through every corridor, essentially mapping the entire maze. It then retracts every tendril that didn't find food, leaving behind a trail of slime that acts as a kind of external memory. The trail reminds the slime mold that certain corridors are dead ends. It avoids these areas and grows exclusively along the shortest path from the beginning of the maze to the tasty treat. But that's not all. After scientists placed food in the relative position of major cities and urban areas, slime molds accurately recreated the rail system of Tokyo and the major roadways of England, Canada, Spain, and Portugal. In other words, this one cell solved a real-world problem that it took teams of engineers to figure out. This might not sound like rocket science, but these experiments are just the beginning. <laughs> 
Researchers are discovering more examples of Physarum's slimy smarts all the time. And this single-celled organism is proving that complex decision-making doesn't require a big brain. In fact, it doesn't require a brain at all. So I love that uh, you can navigate without a brain. So slime molds can do that just by leaving behind these chemical trails that they can then study again and use them to not only navigate their way to food, but do so by finding the most efficient, shortest path possible. So remarkable computations to support navigational strategies, even by a single celled slime mold protist organism. But today we're gonna actually focus in on how the brain how mammalian brains in particular support spatial navigation. We're going to discuss a few kinds of neurons. Uh, they're called place cells and grid cells that support spatial navigation and the brain regions in which they're located. And then we'll focus on an understudied brain region that is also critical for spatial orientation. And we'll look at a particular kind of cell that's recently been identified there to see how it supports spatial orientation. And then we'll look at the links between damage to this understudied brain region and orient orientation difficulties experienced by people with Alzheimer's disease. So let's start with a brain region that may be familiar to many people, but anytime you think of how the brain stores memories, typically most people think of the hippocampus, but the hippocampus is also critical for spatial navigation. And the word hippocampus has a, a long and interesting history in terms of how it came about. So a little background about it. So it was first used in 1587 by Arantius, who was a, a student of a famous Italian anatomist named Vesalius. And in Greek, hippos can mean horse, campe can refer to caterpillar, and campos can refer to a sea monster that is a cross, a mythical creature that is a cross between a horse and a fish or, or a mermaid. It could also refer to a seahorse. So that's the root of the word. So why would anyone want to use hippocampus to, to refer to this part of the human brain? Well, when you look at a freshly cut section of the human brain, you see this kind of uh, structure. This is the hippocampus. And it has these little subdivisions and that may have resembled either seahorses or caterpillars, hence leading to the initial anatomists deciding that they wanted to call the structure the hippocampus. It's also been called the cornu Ammonis or Ammon's horn. Ammon being the Egyptian deity who was often represented as having horns like a ram. And why is that relevant? Well, when you look at the human brain again, the hippocampus takes this uh, three-dimensional structure that is remarkably similar to that of a ram's horns. It kind of starts out in the midline, branches out and down and out, just like a ram's horns would. And those, uh, those two words, cornu and ammonis, led to what's now commonly known as the hippocampal subfield, CA1, CA2, and CA3. Um, those are subdivisions of the hippocampus named after the cornu ammonis term. Here again is another view of the human hippocampus to show you that ram's horns like structure. And these are some other views that may have led to people identifying seahorse like structures within the hippocampus. Here's what the hippocampus looks like in a rat. Again, similar kind of ram's horns like view. And we're gonna stick with the rat here because many of the discoveries about how spatial information is encoded uh, in the hippocampus were initially made in the rat brain. A lot of those have been extended to many other species now. But to make these discoveries, researchers had to put electrical signal recording electrodes into the rat hippocampus, essentially something like this, where you put an electrode into the hippocampus, the rat runs around on a maze and you record electrical signals from neurons in the rat's hippocampus. Uh, 
So this was initially um, done as far back as 1971 um, by a famous paper by John O'Keefe. And let's describe their results in a schematic form here, in a cartoon form. So here's a rat. It's just going to run down a track. It's just uh, running from left to right. And as it moves through, you're recording from neurons in the hippocampus, from one single neuron in the hippocampus. And what neurons use to encode and communicate information is referred to as action potentials. So those are these individual events that are fired by neurons in the hippocampus or in any other brain region. And when you record from a hippocampal neuron, what you find are cells like this one cell depicted here that will only fire these action potentials in one region of space. So only right here. And that location is called this neuron's place field. And this cell is called a place cell because it selectively encodes place by only firing at one given location. So if the rat runs through this maze again, the neuron will fire in the exact same location. You could even take the rat away for multiple hours, maybe even overnight, bring the rat back to the same maze the next day. And that neuron, if you can track it, will fire in the same location again in that environment. So it's a remarkable spatial specificity that you can now see might enable the hippocampus to create a spatial map of perhaps your entire world with different combinations of neurons firing at different locations. You can draw a firing rate map, which basically says that this neuron likes to fire most strongly right here and is not firing at all of these other locations where this line is flat. So this region is the only location where this neuron likes to fire. Here's another little schematic. These are neurons in the hippocampus. And this is just to show you that as a rat or mouse or any other species moves through space, different combinations of cells indeed do encode each of those regions of space. And by tracking which neuron fires where, you can imagine that a species can basically figure out where it is, where it's going, and even think about plans for where it wants to go. So these neurons, these place cells in the hippocampus are absolutely fundamental to encoding spatial information. Let's look at a little video now of an actual place cell being recorded as an animal moves around a, a little open field, a two-dimensional maze here. So it's just walking around and the red dots are action potentials fired by a single hippocampal neuron, a single place cell. And what I want you to just watch out for is how, where the animal goes and where the red dots are fired. So you can see that rat is being tracked and suddenly these red dots start to appear in the bottom left corner of that box. It's been sped up, the rat keeps running around. Keeps going, the little gray traces are just where it's been. You can see it's been all over the maze, but there are barely any red dots in the middle of that maze. All, the majority of red dots the action potentials are all happening right here. And that is indeed the place field of this place cell. And you can make this color map to make that even clearer. So this one cell love to fire only in that one location. When you're doing this experiment, you can even listen to that one cell. It's, um, you just plug that electrical recording into a speaker and you can, it turns it into sound waves and you can listen to what that cell sounds like as this rat is moving around its environment, this little two dimensional box here. So let's listen in on that. So that's where the place field is going to be. Now it's outside of the place field completely silent. That neuron is not doing anything. Back into the place field. Out of the place field, nothing. 
So it's really a remarkable type of cell in the hippocampus that encodes space with really fine grained specificity. As a graduate student doing the similar kinds of recordings, I can tell you that the first day I heard my first place cell and recorded my own place cell, it sounded exactly like that. It's really a rewarding experience, um, kind of uh, kind of thrilling to kind of experience it. So hopefully you've kind of seen every time the rat moves through that location near the upper wall is the only time that the cell is there. So hippocampal place cells, as I've said, will fire in fixed regions of space, and they will do this no matter how fast the rat runs. So if imagine yourself walking down a corridor or a street just really casually at a very slow pace, you know where you are, but you could be in a hurry and be running through or kind of jogging through the same street on another day. You still know where you are. You're in the same location. And the hippocampus has managed to find a way to encode space in the same way, regardless of how fast you move through it. So that's critical because that allows you to know where you are, no matter how fast you're moving. So as I said earlier, um, blind rats can also have place cells. And this is something that Darwin was getting at when he talked about dead reckoning. He said, well, someone who is blind can also have a pretty good sense of where they're going. And indeed, blind rats, without having any visual input coming into their hippocampus, can have place cells. They're almost as spatially informative as place cells in rats who can see. So that may be a clue as to how this, these kinds of cells help to track space even without visual inputs. And, and the story gets a little bit perhaps more complicated and more interesting. So consider a rat running in a hamster wheel. So it's just running in the same place. It's there, it's running, 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 running. In this case, its spatial location is not actually changing. But even in this hamster wheel, in this running wheel, you will not see one single place cell. You will see sequences of place cells. Let's say place cell A, then B, then C, then D, then E. And if the rat leaves and comes back and starts running in the hamster wheel again, you'll get place cells A, then B, then C, then D, then E again. So place cells are not just encoding place they can encode time. They can encode what they're really best at encoding are sequences of events, be they in space or in time. And this is also critical to their role in episodic memory or, or the kinds of memories. Uh, anytime we have a flashback, um, whether good or bad, it, it's not a still image, right? It'll be, it's like a video. You kind of imagine or think back to to memories, for example, if someone was involved uh, in, in, a, in a small car accident and they were kind of recreating that memory, it plays itself as a video. And you can imagine that these place cells are encoding that memory and replaying that memory in the correct sequence. So place cells encode much more than place. They encode time and sequences, and that's critical for encoding episodic memories. And that's why the hippocampus is so important in helping us remember things. So that was all rats, but place cells have been seen in bats and they've even been seen um, in humans. Uh, very rarely do we get the chance to actually record from neurons in the human hippocampus, but in, in patients with epilepsy, they often get implanted with electrodes that will target the hippocampus because that's often where seizures start. And in those cases, while the patients are in the hospital room waiting to have a seizure so that clinicians can identify where their seizures are coming from, um, you can also have the patients play these virtual reality taxi driver games, for example. And even as they walk around, they drive this taxi in this virtual uh, 
maze, a single neuron in the hippocampus may prefer to encode only one part of that maze. So even though this particular person isn't moving, they're just navigating a virtual environment, hippocampal neurons can preferentially encode particular places even in this virtual environment. So place cells may also play a role in navigating not just the real world, but also a virtual world. But how do place cells come to be? One critical region that projects to the hippocampus is called the entorhinal cortex. And so if, if place cells are seen in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex is providing inputs to the hippocampus, a good way to think about how a place cell may come to be is to look at what the entorhinal cortex is doing. So when you do that, you find something, you don't find place cells, but you find something else called grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. So what are grid cells? This is what they look like. This is a grid cell in the entorhinal cortex compared to a place cell in the hippocampus. And remember, this is one single cell. And this is one single cell. So here in the hippocampus, you have a place field in only one location, but these grid cells seem to form a grid all over the entire environment. So they're basically encoding space by forming this repeating pattern grid all over the entire environment. And that is then being fed into the hippocampus, which can then select out particular locations among those grid inputs. This discovery of grid cells together with the older discovery of place cells is Nobel Prize worthy. The 2014 Nobel Prize um, was awarded for the discovery of both place and grid cells to John O'Keefe and the Mosers. Just to kind of recap these grid cells, they fire these regular intervals in space corresponding to these vertices of a triangular grid. So the brain is making these remarkable patterns to encode your entire world with these tessellating triangular grid-like patterns. Each neuron, each grid cell is doing this. Let's look at a grid cell video to see how a grid cell looks when a rat's running around. And remember now, instead of recording from one place cell, you're recording from a single grid cell in the entorhinal cortex. And you can see what that looks like. Again, the dots correspond to individual action potentials from one cell. So here you can see that these little dots are appearing at multiple locations. Even the very first time the rat walks through any location, you can see there's a few dots there that just appeared. And now it's being sped up, keeps walking around. You can see those dots are landing, those action potentials are landing in those fixed grid-like coordinates from a single cell. So again, another remarkable way to encode space. There's another brain region um, that you can see here in the video behind me uh, called the retrospinal cortex. So it's connected to both the hippocampus and to the entorhinal cortex and to many other brain regions as we'll see shortly. And this region is also critical for successful navigation and let's see why. So now let's first think about Alzheimer's disease. 93% of patients with Alzheimer's disease have a tendency to become lost in this one study, and that's been repeated across many studies. And this spatial disorientation is one of the early symptoms, and it becomes progressively worse with the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And one of the questions we want to ask and answer is, what is leading to the spatial disorientation? And this particular spatial disorientation is not related to a memory impairment. It's slightly different. So it's not just because of hippocampal damage. There has to be something else going on here. It's particularly related to not being able to position yourself in space. You could know that you're standing on Main Street and you want to go to State Street, but it becomes really difficult to figure out how to do that which way to proceed to get from Main Street to State Street. 
And spatial disorientation is not, not just seen in persons with Alzheimer's disease, but also in people with Parkinson's disease. So here's another study that looked at Parkinson's disease patients, and again found that the vast majority, I think 43 out of 44 uh, consecutive patients studied in this study, suffered from spatial disorientation as well. And I think this quote kind of helps us appreciate um, how debilitating this can feel. Um, so this is a person who had par Parkinson's disease. And he said, I used to walk alone in the wood, fog or no fog. But when the symptoms of Parkinson's disease appeared, I noticed I could not orient myself anymore. And in case of fog, I got lost. Now I am too disabled to get lost anymore. So a few key things there. He's been navigating this wood for a very long time. He's been walking in these woods for a very long time. He's, it's familiar to him. But as the symptoms of Parkinson's disease appear, he can no longer orient himself specifically in the case of fog. Why in the case of fog? Well, that's when he can't use his visual senses to tell where he's going. But typically, that's where this internal sense of space would have allowed him to find his way home. But because that internal sense of spatial orientation is impaired, he's unable to find his way home in the case of fog. Here are two additional examples. The, both of them are case studies. In the first one here, he was referred to our department because two weeks before, while driving his car, he suddenly realized he was unable to recognize the streets along his way home. He got lost and had to call on some passerby to help. Since then, the patient has been severely disoriented in space. And another case study. The patient suddenly lost his knowledge of the route to his house while returning home after work. He could recognize buildings and the landscape and therefore understand where he was, but the landmarks that he recognized did not provoke directional information about any other places. Consequently, he could not determine which direction to proceed to go home. So hopefully you can see the similarity in, in all of these examples. You recognize everything around you, but figuring out a plan to get home is just not as easy anymore. But remarkably, these two examples are not patients with either Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Instead, both these patients suffered damage to a part of their brain called the retrospinal cortex. In one case, due to a cancerous tissue there, and in the other case, due to a hemorrhage. So what this shows is that the retrospinal cortex is critical for spatial orientation, and damage of any kind to the retrospinal cortex is likely to precipitate itself as spatial disorientation. Here's another example of spatial, retrospinal cortical damage. So here's a patient who'd also suffered damage to the retrospinal cortex, he was asked to draw his neighborhood. So he draws the home, a river, the library, a McDonald's, and the parking lot. But as you can see, there's not much detail there. This is the same neighborhood drawn by the patient's son. So not only is there not much detail in terms of that neighborhood, but the orientations linking home to library or home to McDonald's or home to the parking lot are all off. Again spatial disorientation manifesting itself even for the neighborhood in which this person lives. And damage to the retrospinal cortex can also lead to severe memory impairments. So in, in this case, another patient with uh, lesions to the retrospinal cortex, and the case study says his retrograde amnesia increased postoperatively to encompass more than four years, which means that he could not remember the birth of his second child who was four years of age, believing that he only had one child. His anterograde amnesia, meaning future ability to form future memories, was profound. By lunch, he could not reliably remember what he had done that morning. So the retrospinal cortex is critical for spatial orientation and for a lot of memories formation. So we study this retrospinal cortex and we study the circuitry and the neurons and the oscillations and the behaviors that are encoded by this retrospinal cortex and how it contributes to spatial orientation. Today, I'll kind of just focus in on 
one particular aspect of it and a unique kind of neuron that we found um, in this part of the brain. So first, why is it called the retrospinal cortex? Well, it's, it's much simpler to kind of uh, understand than why they initially called the hippocampus the hippocampus. This is a cross section through the human brain and it sits behind this bulk of white matter that connects the two hemispheres of the human brain called the corpus callosum. And this part, this most um, rearmost part of the corpus callosum is called the splenium. And the retrosplenial cortex is the part of the brain immediately behind the splenium. Hence it's retrosplenial cortex. And there are two parts to it. And what I'll tell you about is referred to as the retrosplenial granular cortex. And in this part of the brain, what we found is that there's a unique neuron that is not like any other neurons, either in the retrospinal cortex, nor in any other part of the brain. For reasons I'll kind of get to, uh, we call it, uh, or the grad student who found it likes to call it the little neuron that could. Here are pictures of neurons. And if you look at this neuron, you can see it has all these branches it almost looks like a tree with a big root-like structure here and then growing uh, branches up top. And this is what typical neurons in the brain often look like. They're called regular spiking neurons or RS neurons, if you will. But in the retrospinal cortex, you also find these much smaller neurons with fewer root-like structures and fewer branches going up there. And these neurons also fire action potentials in very different ways. They, they're really excitable. Anytime you provide input to them, they will keep firing and they can keep firing for really long periods of time. So they're small and can keep going, which is what led to the term, um, the little neuron that could. It can just keep going and keep going and keep going and it's very small. The technical name we gave it is a low Rio based cell, but all that means is that it's hyper excitable and ready to fire and kind of keep firing at any moment in time. We found that this is not just there, but it's actually in this part of the retrospinal cortex, it is the most frequently encountered neuron in, in, in the retrospinal cortex. So it's not just that there's a couple of them here or there, but the bulk of neurons in these layers of the retrospinal cortex are actually made up of these little neurons that could. So they're clearly very important for encoding in this part of the brain. And here I'm going to play a little video by Alan Brennan, who was first author on, on this work that led to this uh, neurons discovery. And she explains why they're so useful for spatial orientation. The Ahmed Lab at the University of Michigan investigates how our brains help us navigate in space and know where we are at any given moment, even when we're just standing still. Using mice and rats, they investigate the neural circuits underlying navigation particularly those employed by a brain region called the retrosplenial cortex. Patients with retrosplenial damage have severe spatial disorientation, such that landmarks, like their home or office, do not provide any directional information, so they cannot connect these places together on a map. Thus, they become lost even in familiar environments. The Ahmed Lab has identified an important piece of the puzzle explaining how the retrosplenial cortex encodes direction. A unique neuron located in superficial layers 2 and 3 of the retrosplenial cortex, which just so happen to receive direction related inputs. In these layers, there exist two distinct types of excitatory neurons the common regular spiking neuron, and a smaller unique neuron identified by the Ahmed lab. There are two main differences between these cell types that make the unique neurons better at processing sustained direction. The first difference is their ability to fire rapidly and persistently due to their narrow spikes and lack of adaptation. In contrast, the regular spiking neurons fire less and slow down their response rate over time. They can't keep up. The second difference is this unique neuron's ability to respond to even tiny inputs. It has a low Rio base, which means the amount of input it needs to evoke a spike is much smaller than what the regular spiking neuron needs. Since this was their most distinctive computational feature, the Ahmed lab has named these cells low Rio-based neurons. These two differences make the low Rio-based neurons more determined and persistent, which is exactly what helps them encode sustained direction inputs 
from other specialized neurons called head direction cells. Head direction cells, existing in other brain regions involved in our internal compass, will continue to fire their signals the entire time the mouse is facing one direction, and they connect directly to the retrosplenial cortex where the low real base neurons live. Using a computational model, the Ahmed lab tested whether these continuous head direction cell inputs recorded from a behaving mouse could be encoded by low rheobase and regular spiking neuron models. They found that the low rheobase neuron model could reliably respond to the continuous head direction inputs, while the RS neuron model could not, responding only to the first input before becoming slow and inconsistent. This now suggests a parallel coding scheme used by the retrosplenial cortex to detect and encode direction. The regular spiking neurons may detect change in direction, like when the mouse turns its head, while the low rheobase neurons can detect continued direction, such as when the mouse faces one way. This distinction is critical for navigation. It's important for the brain to be able to detect when we turn, but it needs to also know when we're standing still. A compass always has to know which way is north. It wouldn't be very useful without that persistent sense of direction. That is exactly what the low rheobase neurons can provide. These All right, so um, it's a remarkable neuron. It can encode information in a different way, and it essentially can act as a long-lasting compass-like signal. We then looked at what kind of inputs precisely these cells receive. And what makes the retrosplenial cortex so unique is that it's connected to so many other parts of the brain. It's connected to the hippocampus that we've talked about, the entorhinal cortex, and to this part of the brain called the thalamus, where those head direction cells that Ellen just mentioned are located. And it's able to integrate all of these inputs. But just because a brain region is receiving inputs doesn't mean every cell in that brain region receives inputs. So we zoomed in to try to understand which of these two neuron types, the regular ones or these little neurons that could, which of them receives all of this spatial information from the uh, hippocampal formation or from head direction cells in the thalamus? And what we found remarkably was that only those low rheobase cells or those little neurons that could, only they receive direct input from head direction cells in the thalamus. Whereas these are these little purple action potentials that you see here. So they, these are being driven by those thalamic inputs, but the regular spiking cells essentially are doing nothing. They're not getting those inputs. And this is the same image you see behind me, but the reason for that is, is as follows. The blue you see here are those inputs from head direction cells in the thalamus. This cell right here is that little neuron that could, and here are its branches you can see that its branches overlap with those blue inputs from the thalamus. Very clearly right up here in what's called layer one. But these other neurons, the regular spiking neurons, they send their branches up, but not as far. You see how they just kind of stop short of entering that blue zone right here? That means they're just physically not overlapping with the inputs coming in from the thalamus. So it's a pretty simple reason as to why they don't receive this directional information. And what this leads to is a map of the retrosplenial cortex where these low rheobase cells, the little neurons that could, are the only ones that are receiving directional and spatial information. Whereas these regular spiking neurons are getting very different kinds of, you could call them cognitive, mnemonic, higher order type inputs that are less elemental in terms of their spatial information. So as far as orientation computations go, the initial cell that should be focused on is really the low rio base cell in the retrospinal cortex. And the regular spiking cells perhaps do more complicated calculations. Uh, what we also found was that not only can these little neurons that could encode head direction, but because of the way that these inputs come in, they can compute from scratch the speed at which an animal is turning its head. And this kind of shows that the inputs do not encode speed, but the low rio base cell does encode speed very strongly. So what that means is that these low rio base cells, these little neurons that could, 
are in, sitting in a brain region that is important for spatial orientation, and they can compute, meaning encode, not only the direction an animal is facing, but also how quickly it is turning its head, at what speed it is rotating its head. And you can imagine why those two pieces of information are critical, because as required by Charles Darwin's dead reckoning, you need to know not just how far you've walked, but in what direction you've walked and for how long. And if you can track when you turned your head and kept walking, you can use all of that information to orient yourself and to help compute where you are and where you want to go. Now to finish off, I'll just kind of say a little bit about how we're trying to understand the retrospinal cortex in terms of Alzheimer's disease using preclinical models, mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. One critical part of Alzheimer's disease is that, and it's been long appreciated that there are these other types of neurons called cholinergic neurons that live in another brain region that are known to be damaged in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And the question is, what do these cholinergic neurons do and could their loss actually play a role in spatial disorientation? For that to be the case, they would have to be strong projections of these cholinergic neurons to the retrospinal cortex. So we're next going to look at how cholinergic inputs come into the retrospinal cortex and what happens to them in Alzheimer's disease. Here's a picture of the brain, and this is the retrospinal cortex right here that I'm highlighting over. And the green specks here show you the density of cholinergic inputs to each part of the brain. And as you can see here, there is this dense band of cholinergic inputs specifically in this part of the retrospinal cortex. And you can zoom in there, right there, and you can see again that this band is actually in the same place, and you can see it behind me, it's in the exact same place where those thalamic head direction inputs were coming in. So the cholinergic inputs and the head direction inputs are overlapping in the retrospinal cortex, and they're very dense. So clearly, the two systems are working together to encode spatial and directional information in the retrospinal cortex. But strikingly, what happens in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, which is represented here by this 5X FAD term, this is the wild type. So I mean, the non-Alzheimer's mouse, this model mouse, this is the mouse model of Alzheimer's. You can see that that dense, thick band right over here has essentially disappeared. It's not as dense anymore. It looks the same as the rest of it. So that's a sign that very early on, these cholinergic inputs are altered in these mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. And Typically, these cholinergic inputs lead, let neurons fire persistently. And as we said, these low Ryobe cells and other neurons will need to fire persistently to encode information. Well, we found some interesting um, computational abilities here, but what, what essentially it boils down to is this ability to fire persistently, which is critical for memory and orientation encoding, is actually lost very early on in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease in these 5X FAD mice. You can see here that regularly these neurons can fire, keep firing, but in the presence of acetylcholine, they cannot do, do that in Alzheimer's disease models. So I'll, I'll summarize there. And what we've found is that the little neuron that code is localized to the retrospinal cortex. The cell selectively receives input from directional and spatial cells in other parts of the brain. And it can encode not only head direction, but also head speed. And we found that there are other neurons that can fire persistently in the presence of acetylcholine. But in Alzheimer's disease mouse models, that no longer happens, suggesting that in, in these mice, the retrospinal computations that support spatial orientation are impaired. We're currently working to understand exactly how the little neuron that code is impaired in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease so that we can identify and pinpoint potential therapies that can help it function normally. I wanna end by just acknowledging all the amazing members uh, of, of my lab and many of our collaborators. A lot of the work that I talked about here regarding the retrospinal cortex and the little neuron that could was done by Ellen Brennan, as well as Isabella Jadrasia-Cape, 
and Samir Kalasa. They were all co-first authors on, on one of the key papers presented there and the funding. And uh, thank you um, for giving me the chance to present this work. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. That was, that was really fascinating. Um, I just wanna go ahead and ask a, uh, I have uh, three or four questions. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. And uh, uh, so I'm gonna take this in order mm -hmm. of presentation. So I'll start with the, um, the navigation work, yep. which I thought was really fascinating, particularly that, that nature paper, which I'd not heard about um, with the European Robin. Yep. And I was just hoping to get some more details about that. Um, so is it is that thought to be okay so just to recap so there's some uh, I have my notes on this but it's on another page so I'll just try to wing it here but yeah there's mm -hmm. there's some that in within the retina there's something that um, responds to the um, to the uh, uh, field on the on earth that it picks up and it varies during migration is this thought is this um ability to detect and that helps thank you that helps with navigation is that thought to be uniform across all migratory birds or is this is this just what the european robin figured out through evolution so this is the european robin for now um, they compared in the same study they looked at two other non-migratory birds and they didn't see as robust a magnetic a response to magnetic inputs magnetic fields and even though they may have the same protein, the cryptochrome, the precise structure and the way it interacts with other proteins is not the same. So it doesn't have the same remarkable ability to respond to a magnetic field. How this compares across migratory birds, I think remains to be examined in detail, but it would be fascinating if there are subtle differences in the way they encode um, the Earth's magnetic field and whether or not that correlates precisely with how far or what preferential directions, for example, they could they could travel. But yeah, it really, um, I, I hadn't seen this paper until very recently as well, and, but it's a remarkable biological correlate that has to do with these rapid uh, states that these um, reaction products of cryptochrome can alternate between that ends up underlying uh, potential magnetic detection. And I should add that there's still a lot more to figure out. Yeah. For example, how is the cell that, how is this, combination of states we can tell it's different from this combination down here with a lot more dark red but how exactly does the bird use that to decide you know what i think i'm really heading slightly southeast here and i need to adjust so there's there's some beautiful uh, circuitry and computations to understand even from here okay great thank you and and so related to this mm -hmm. uh and again i i imagine that the data it's just not known but i'll just ask you yeah speculate if it's possible yeah. is uh, so obviously there are like probably many ways to solve this migratory problem and this mm -hmm. may be one of them yeah. it does the european robin also use other cues or is this it and it is this is how it this is how it's all is it the idea that this is how it solves the problem or is it also relying on other cues as well i think yeah no, as you said not known for sure right now but i think most uh, this paper and uh, the current status would suggest that it's just one of possibly many cues that are being used by the robin. Um, having a magnetic sensor is obviously an advantage. It's a leg up, if you will, or a wing up, uh, but it's, uh, it, it probably is working in concert with all of the other senses that it has. And, you know, that, that same issue actually uh, um, is also critical for all other species, we, we really do combine multiple senses and multiple computational abilities to encode our navigational paths. And it's really, for example, as you saw in the example with the, the person with Parkinson's disease, who said only in the case of fog could I no longer navigate. So there's a backup system in place, which is some internal sense of space, even when you cannot see. And it's when the visual system fails and the backup system fails, that's when navigational abilities start to go south. So it's clearly uh, evolution has ensured that a lot of redundant systems to encode navigation have been built in. Great. Okay. Thank you. And uh, one more question on navigation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. move on to Alzheimer's and no, that's the fun part. Yeah, it's, uh... yeah. This is the, uh, 
uh, the more practical uh, question. So uh, in Ann Arbor, I think I experienced this and many of us experienced this. We have a lot, uh, as the weather gets warm, we have a lot of ants coming into the house. And then huh. I'm always rushing around trying to figure out how to, how to get them get out. <laughs> and you offer one solution where putting the, uh, putting the stilts on each <laughs> ant, then they get lost on their way home. But it, it's, is it also true that like they, they drop a scent? I, obviously they go in lines and they drop some kind of scent to figure their way home. Is that accurate? And then, um, you know, trying to get rid of that scent may reduce the inflow of ants. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so just like the, the protest, which could use chemicals to kind of navigate its way around complex mazes, um, those kind of chemical trails are used by different types of ants in interesting ways as well. Um, so counting steps, once again, is not the only way. So I, I think that's absolutely true, but I think it also depends on the exact species of ant as to how effective that strategy would be. Mm -hmm. um, so you're spot on yet again, another redundant series of navigational computations that each species is using to walk around uh, its environment. Yeah. But from an exterminator point of view, it's not helpful that they have mul multiple solutions to the problem because wiping out one doesn't prevent them, doesn't yeah, so, get lost, yeah. So you got to get rid of those odors and you got to put stilts on them. So right. on each, every single ant, super glue on stilts, <laughs> uh, no problem whatsoever, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, great. Thank you. And all right, so then moving on to um, to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, so I had two questions along these lines. So I was just wondering, so you're talking about the animal model, mm -hmm. um, looking at the retro that the animal model of Alzheimer's specifically, um, you see these alterations in um, in the genetic version. Um, mm -hmm that uh, and the, you see alterations in the retrosplenial cortex i know in the clinic like in a human clinical sample it probably gets pretty messy and i know there's a lot of damage in the brain but have they found like specific uh effects in the retrosplenial cortex in uh, through autopsy or neuroimaging research when they're alive yeah absolutely so using neuroimaging research it's a great question so you can look at uh, even in the earliest stages of what's called prodromal Alzheimer's disease, where it manifests itself as mild cognitive impairment. Um, in these patients who would go on to develop Alzheimer's disease at the earliest stages, there's hypoactivity in specifically the retrospenal cortex compared to control uh, subjects. Um, so retrospenal cortical uh, impairments are actually one of the earliest manifestations in people with even mild cognitive impairments. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, absolutely right that the retrospinal cortex, even though it's underappreciated, the literature does have key data points in persons with Alzheimer's disease suggesting retrospinal alterations. Great. Thank you. And, and the last question is, and this is going a little bit out of your area, my uh -huh. guess is, but like, uh, I just hoping to end on an upbeat note. Um, what's going on in terms of the latest treatments with either uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and slowing the progression of the disease. Uh, I like 10 years ago, there's a lot of excitement in Alzheimer's particularly. Uh, and I was just wondering what the latest is uh, from your perspective in terms of uh, hopeful treatments that may become available. I think one of the key pushes that, um, so, you know, you can kind of, you can ask what's about to, what's on the horizon. So what's, what's on the way and you can, you can start to predict that based on what the NIH and other funding bodies are starting to fund and where they want the research to go and what scientists think should be pursued. So the classical theories uh, having to do with uh, these certain proteins called amyloid beta in Alzheimer's disease, they continue to exist and they're really important. And these tau markers, so reducing, finding ways to reduce these pathological proteins is an important way to go. But in addition to that, I think there's a desire to kind of find totally um, other approaches uh, to try to actually improve these circuits. And oddly enough, one of the oldest uh, attempted therapies had to do with the cholinergic system. Mm. Um, and they often 
And that doesn't get as much attention anymore because many of those clinical trials failed many, many years ago. So, you know, you can go back to uh, 30, 40 years ago with cholinergic hypotheses regarding Alzheimer's disease existing. Many drugs were proposed and they didn't quite work. So, and, and for that reason, the cholinergic hypothesis was put aside. But there's interesting information to be gained by looking at fine-grained details, which may actually lead to the next generation of therapies, which is, for example, what we're seeing in the retrospinal cortex even when you apply a cholinergic drug, the same neuron that could fire continuously in the presence of this cholinergic drug can no longer do so, even when you give it that cholinergic drug. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the receptor, the thing that responds to uh, that cholinergic drug is actually missing itself. So if you want to try to come up with new therapies, and these are some approaches that are being developed by some companies right now, is to actually try to augment the ability of these receptors, for example, for cholinergic or other drugs, to try to restore the ability of these neurons to function in the way that they used to. It's, you know, many of these are still long shots. I mean, I think we have to take everything with a grain of salt because of how early stage some of these things are. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that fine grained detailed understanding of how and where the precise alterations happen um, is going to help. And I think targeting these receptors is going to be key because you can't just give a drug when the receptor is not there. You got to find another way to augment that receptor. Mm. Okay, great. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, doing this. It's been, it's been a pleasure, Omar. Thank you. Thanks. This was a lot of fun.